How many of you have heard this saying? A poor workman blames his tools. I think it's an ancient Chinese proverb. I don't know. I just kind of made that up because I can't figure out where it came from. And I've heard it all my life and said it all my life, and I'm getting up there. So it's ancient. And it's true, as these things tend to be. A poor workman blames his tools. And what it means, of course, is a, a, uh, take uh, any workman, uh, building cabinets, doing plumbing work, whatever, all the stuff like we've been doing, and the, the, the product isn't what we wanted, the, the, the result isn't what we wanted, and we say, well, I, just, I don't have good enough tools. When really what's happening is, I just didn't do a good enough job. And so we blame the tools instead of the person handling the tools, which is usually ourselves, that's easy to do. But, you know, you could expand that, of course, into all sorts of realms. So when we make choices and we take actions and they don't result in what we'd hoped for, desired, then we say, well, I didn't have the right X. I didn't have all the information I needed. And I'm not suggesting that that is never true. But first and foremost, when we're in this kind of situation where maybe we don't like how something turned out, let's check ourselves first. Because maybe, just maybe, we're blaming the tools because we're just being lazy or inattentive to what we're doing, right? And so I want to make that point first very clear that we are not to be lazy and inattentive. This person's drinking coffee, working on her bed. She's working. She's busy. We need to be busy, doing something productive. There's a lot of Proverbs that talk about laziness, aren't there? I'm not going to read them all, but just a couple. Let's go to Proverbs 24, and we'll begin reading in verse 30. Solomon there has all sorts of wisdom. Solomon wasn't lazy. He was super wealthy, super wise, and super busy. It wasn't always super right, but he was super busy. He knew something about sitting around doing nothing. Imagine running an empire, and Solomon had an empire, the wealthiest Israel ever was, and he oversaw all kinds of things. Imagine working for Solomon and being that guy that was just kind of poking along, not doing their job. I would imagine that Solomon didn't tolerate that for very long. Solomon didn't tolerate poor workmanship in any phase of his life. Chapter 24, Proverbs, verse 30. I pass by the field of a sluggard. I'm sure you've read this one or heard this one before. I pass by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense, and behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles, and its stone wall was broken down. And then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. We do need to work. We do need to take care of our business and take care of our things. We need to be, again, intentional and uh, purposeful in our lives. Turn to chapter 18 of Proverbs and verse 9. Proverbs 18, verse 9. Whoever is slack in his work is a brother to him who destroys. So there are people who are actively tearing things down and breaking things up, and sometimes you need those people. But if you're just lazy, you're their brother. You're destroying things too. It just takes longer. How about chapter 10? In verse 26, if you're a lazy employee, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to those who sent him. There are some New Testament passages too. One in particular stood out to me. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul writing to the churches there. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. The church had responsibility to take care of people who were in need, 
But if you are in need because you are lazy, we're not going to do that. So, physical things, spiritual things. The lesson is still the same. We ought not to be lazy. We need to be productive, intentional, thoughtful in our day-to-day lives. And again, this is not saying we can't take time off and relax and recreate. We need to do that. We are made to have some time to rest and to, to ha- you know, do other things. But we have to be intentional and thoughtful about what we're doing, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, whether it's with our spiritual lives. Again, lots of wisdom here. Proverbs 22 and verse 29. Of course, Solomon would talk about the opposite of laziness as well. Here he said, Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. He will be noticed. His work will be noticed if he does good work. We're not talking about tools here. We're talking about the person doing good work. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, we have one of those sort of general commands that is echoed throughout Scripture. Verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom and shield to which you are going. In other words, you only have the time to work with the time you have here on this earth, so use it well. And then the, and remember, Ecclesiastes more or less is talking about life under the sun, not really focused on the spiritual things. Solomon's suggesting that life under the sun is always the same, which it is. We, we were born, we live, we die, we work, and we enjoy our fruits of our labor. That's the kind of thing Solomon's telling us. And occasionally he reminds us that God exists But you go up to Colossians chapter 3, and Paul echoes exactly the same sentiment, and he puts the real spiritual twist to it, the real reason. Verse 23, Colossians 3, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you're doing. With the one caveat, if you're sinning, you can't be serving the Lord Christ, right? But whatever else you're doing, again, whether it's working, going to school, those kind of things, do it as if you were serving the Lord, because, in fact, you are. You know, Christians ought to be, I don't want to say the best at everything, but we ought to be good. Good employees, good students, all that sort of thing. How about 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15? Paul's encouragement to Timothy here, this young man, he said in verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. That sounds like he's working at it. Some of your older translations say study, which again carries the idea of work and effort and time spent. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. If you've ever been a boss, and you've had employees who were not good at their job, that was terrible. I was explaining this phenomenon to somebody the other day. I used to work in a restaurant many, many years ago. And all restaurants and places like this suffer from this kind of thing because they're sort of entry jobs, right? So you hire anybody. You need bodies to fill up the space. But... There's always a handful of people who are really quality at their job. There's a handful who are okay at it. And there's a handful who are just terrible at it, either because they're lazy or maybe they're just not good. But you've got to have the bodies there. And who ends up picking up all the slack are the ones who work harder. There's reward in that. There's always those people around. Don't be that person. And certainly don't be that person in spiritual matters person who's lazy. So, do your best. James chapter 1, verse 22. You know, we always read this passage about uh, the mirror and all of that, but he simply says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Again, there's work to be done. There's something to do. And Romans 12, verse 11, in that list of characteristics that we are given by Paul that Christians should possess, one of them is Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. 
It's a great passage to remind us that our spiritual side of things, the spiritual nature, needs to be every bit as busy and robust and thoughtful and uh, studied for as our physical life. So you, whatever your career path is, you worked hard to get there, and maybe you went to school, or maybe you got special training, or maybe you put in years and years and years at it. It's no different for the spiritual thing. And so don't be lazy. So we say a poor workman blames his tools. A lot of the time, it's because the workman wasn't attentive to the work, wasn't paying attention, wasn't doing their best work, wasn't all in. But, sometimes, the tools really are bad. So what then? Well, we don't want to use poor tools, right? Don't use poor tools. Turns out, all these days I've been going down to the kids' uh, place and working on it, been doing drywall. My drywall tee is bit, just a little bit. Not so you can see it, but when you start cutting, you can see it's bit. When you measure and then you put the T in there, it's off. Just a little. So I've been accounting for that, adjusting the T, the tool, so that I could get the cut straight. Okay. We got dull saw blades. You ever tried to cut something with a dull saw blade? We got dull box cutters after about five or six cuts on sheetrock with the box cutter, that blade's done. You can keep using it, but it gets harder and harder and harder to use. And it doesn't cut as nicely. We got rusty pliers, old batteries for our power tools, right? Warped two by fours, it is on and on. It, there's all kinds of problems with the tools or with the wood or whatever. And we have some good tools also. You know, we've all bought some nice tools. The good news for me was when I started going down there, it was Father's Day month, so I got to take advantage of all the Father's Day sales to buy myself some new tools. We'll probably end up just staying down there anyway. Okay, so what do we do? What is the solution when you have rusty, bad, dull tools? Well, in the physical world, you fix them or you buy new ones. All right, dull saw blade, throw it away, buy a new one. Rusty pliers, you can clean that up. My bent tee, that's going to go in the trash and i got to get a new one. Except I'm almost done. And I hope I never do that again. So, okay, that's what you do, right? We understand the concept. You just get a new tool. You get a better tool. You get a quality tool. And there is... There's something to having quality tools as opposed to bad and poor quality tools, of course. That's the solution. But what about our spiritual tools? What do we do? Same thing. We fix them and we get, we get them in shape. Now to mix a few metaphors here, what if we're using poor quality tools like a rusty sword? So be thinking of Ephesians 6. We'll come back to that later. So we've got a rusty sword, right? God told, or Paul wrote to put on the whole armor of God, so we'll use a couple examples from there. A rusty sword. A rusty sword will kill someone. But it's harder. It's more liable to get stuck in the sheath. It's more liable to break. It's, more, it's not going to be as sharp. It's not going to work as well. I almost brought one because I have one at the house. It's, it's ugly, too. A rusty sword. Of course, the sword is the Word of God. That's evident from Ephesians 6, Hebrews chapter 4, a number of places. What does that really mean? It means we have a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding and a lack of skill with Scripture if our sword is rusty. And we need to fix that. So what you would do with the sword, you would clean it up, maybe grind it down, poly you would do whatever you could. Make it functional again. We need to do that with our minds, with our, the spiritual tools we have. Hebrews chapter 5, uh, at the end of the chapter there in verse 11, the writer here is getting on to this group of people because their spiritual shorts had got grown dull and rusted, and they weren't using them properly, they weren't using them well, and he told them so. Verse 11, about this we have much to say. 
and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. So again, you might be a child physically and therefore unskilled. You might be a child in the sense of a new Christian or newly returning Christian, sure. And so you're unskilled because of a lack of training and time. That can be fixed. Maybe you're unskilled because you're lazy. Maybe you've let the sword grow dull because you just hadn't taken care of it. Well, solid food, he goes on, is for the mature, those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay, it's the Word of God. I can't dull the Word of God, but... Here's the reality. The Word of God is communicated through me and you. And if I'm dull and I'm unskilled, that's what's going to be presented to the people that hear it. That's when I answer questions that people have. That's what they're going to get. A mangled up, poorly cut version of God's Word. Poorly understood. So what if we're using that? Rusty sword. What if we have a broken shield, right? Paul said the shield is the shield of faith, the thing that will protect us from the fiery darts of Satan. What if it's broken? And that doesn't do much good, does it? And that sort of translates to weak and broken faith, doesn't it? Because it is the shield of faith. What prevents a good deal of what Satan throws at us? Our faith in Jesus Christ and the truth. It's not magical. It's that we know what's right and we know what's wrong and we trust in God's process. When that trust is broken, when our faith is broken, well then, we let all that stuff through. This reminded me of the, the soil parable, Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus explains some of the soil. So remember, one fell on the wayside, never even penetrated, birds ate it up. But the second two, those people heard it and were glad and had some enough faith anyway to, to receive the word and something happened, but both of them gave up for different reasons. Remember, verse 20, Matthew 13, As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. That's a broken or weak faith. And difficult times come, and they will. There is no way to avoid that. It's how are we going to handle it? Well, again, God provided us the right tools for the job. But if our shield's broken, it won't do any good. Well, then the other person, the one who was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word, and it proves unfruitful. Again, they got it, they heard it, but... Their, the stuff in their life just took over. Pushed, it, pushed out the gospel. It was weak. What if we're wearing a cracked breastplate? You want to go into battle wearing a breastplate that's got a big crack across the front of it? You're going to die. It's not going to be helpful. I think of this as like hypocrisy, kind of wearing that mask of Christianity like many people do but not really being Christian. It's it's a very thin shell. That's another way I guess this would be, maybe. It's very thin. In World War I, here we go again, sorry. It's reminded me of this. You you can probably, if you look up World War I French breastplate, you'll see the picture that I'm talking about. They had these French troops that wore, they were cavalry, and they wore these metal breastplates, so they went to war, and guess what happened? bullets and the cannons and everything just went right through them. They probably knew that ahead of time, but the Europeans love their cavalry charges anyway. But it, it didn't matter. It was essentially wearing nothing. And right after that, everyone stopped wearing armor because it didn't do any good. So even perfectly functional in the wrong place. A cracked breastplate, wearing the mask of righteousness. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. Jesus, of the many times, warns them about hypocrisy. 
In the meantime, verse 1, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they, were, that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. In other words, God knows. And so we can give the facade of righteousness all we want, you know, kind of be Sunday Christians and that kind of thing. God knows. And that's really all that matters. But the truth is, so does everybody else. Don't, you're not fooling anyone, just yourself. And you have a cracked or a paper-thin breastplate that is not going to do you any good. We could go on, but I think the point has been made. If we have poor tools, the tools are in bad shape. They're the right tools, but they're in bad shape. We need to correct them. We need to fix them. Add layers to that breastplate. Fix the shield. Bind it up. Sharpen the sword. All that. That comes down to the first point. Not being lazy. Studying. Working hard. Trying to understand what it is God wants. So we don't use poor tools. What if, though... We're using the wrong tools altogether, because that happens all the time, too. You don't always have exactly the tool you need, so you find something that will substitute and maybe kind of sort of work, and it will, maybe, for a while. The screwdriver does function as a chisel for a while, but it doesn't function as well as a chisel, as many of us have found out. A battery pack on the bottom of your drill kind of works as a hammer two or three times. But these things don't work effectively. They don't help. They actually typically will make things worse in the end. And so, again, the same idea. What if we're using the wrong spiritual tools? So again, God gave us the sword and the breastplate and the helm and all that, which all stems from God's Word. What if we're relying on the wisdom of men? And I think this comes in a number of flavors that we could think about. I'm going to give you three. What if we're using just the wrong tools? Not even just poor tools, the wrong tools. What do we do? Well, the wisdom of men is, is oftentimes very much about selfishness and what I want very hedonistic, right? Humanistic. Peter wrote about this in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. It's very, very uh, self-centered. And he's talking about false teachers and how they operate and what they do. Verse 12, these, like irrational animals, beasts, some of your translations say, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of, of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These false teachers, like most, were appealing to our basic, baser instincts, our baser desires. And so this could be sort of health and wealth and profit gospel. Um, it could be, you know, very loose sort of rules and regulations. And, you know, I don't know, you can have all the wives you want or just kind of crazy things like that. And all this sort of, you know, sexual behavior that gets done in the name of religion. And just on and on we could go. It's all this kind of false thinking and that certainly motivates many people and that's what they rely on and that's the wrong tool altogether that's not going to do anything I mean, that's using a pair of pliers to be a hammer it's not going to work what about philosophy or education relying on that again another side of human wisdom we have 
an, an unprecedented ability to get educated if we want to. And there's a lot of good philosophy out there if we want to find it. There's a lot of garbage out there too. And if we rely solely on that, we're also in trouble. We read this recently in our Bible class. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. In other words, just worldly wisdom's not going to get it. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I appreciate Sebastian reading all these songs about Jesus this morning, because I'm not really talking much about that today. But we understand, that's the center of all of this. And what he did, and who he is. That's where wisdom is. The wisdom of philosophy might be useful, and it is useful in this world, but it ultimately will lead us astray, if that's all that we rely on, if that's what we're using for our tool. Something that Paul wrote about in Colossians chapter 2, I'll call this asceticism, you know, sort of the idea that if we cut ourselves off from all of this stuff, that somehow that'll make us more righteous. I'm not talking about cutting ourselves off from sin, that's that's what we're supposed to do. I'm talking about just other things that are a part of this world. Colossians 2 and verse 20. Again, he's dealing with people who are false teachers, but they're coming at it not from a morally debased way like the ones Peter was talking about, and not from a sort of human wisdom, Greek Western philosophy way like we just read here, but more of a we're going to be extra righteous kind of a thing. We're going to do it better than even God said. Verse 20, Colossians 2, if, Christ, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations, do not t handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teaching. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. You know, you want to go become a monk and isolate yourself? That's not going to help you be righteous. In fact, it's actually going to be the opposite of what God wants from you. Because he wants you to be a light and salt. He wants you to be out there and fighting and combating. So there's a lot of ways we could probably think about the wisdom of men. Relying on that, it's a bad tool. It's the wrong tool for the job. We have the traditions of men too. Matthew 15, verse 1, Jesus commented on that, that uh, the scribes and Pharisees had created all this tradition, and that was taking place of doing what was right. Can you imagine? We can be guilty of the same thing. This is not unique to this group of people. Matthew 15, 1, the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. So admittedly, right off the bat, this is not the law. This is not in Moses' law. This is the tradition of the elders that's been developed in the, pre in the previous 1,500 years somewhere. That you have to wash your hands before you eat. Now we know that's good hygiene, yada yada. But they're saying it's the tradition and it's, it's as good as law. Well, of course, Jesus answers them with his own question. Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells us father or mother, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. In other words... I'm devoting all my stuff to the Lord so I don't have to take care of mom and dad when they get old. Which is what the law says you're supposed to do. So now their tradition's breaking the law. He says, how do you do that? 
So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching us doctrines and commandments of men. We can't rely on the traditions of men. The tradition of God? Yes. The traditions that the apostles, the Spirit, through the apostles set down for us? Yes. But the traditions of men, the traditions of me, or this church? No. Those are not binding. What about relying on the government? A lot of people do that. They think their salvation is in having the right government. Look, I'm all for having a good government. Don't get me wrong. And we still probably have the best one, other than a benevolent dictatorship where I'm that person. Uh, if we think that salvation or we're going to deal with, address spiritual issues through the government, no, we're not. Because sometimes the government rules in our favor, and sometimes they don't. And that's the way it is. And that's the way it will ever be. You've got to remember, it's only this minute period of time where you people like you and me even have any influence over the government. Acts chapter 5, you remember this? The, uh, some of the apostles, newly minted apostles, had been preaching and teaching. In chapter 4, they were told to quit. Here they are again, arrested again. When they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles said, We must obey God rather than men. I don't care what the government says or does. We've got to do the right thing. And it's not based on what the government says is legal or not. That does not matter. I mean, we are supposed to be subject to the government as far as we can. Not to obey God rather than men. If we're relying on the government to save us or to make the environment good for us to be Christians, forget it. It's not how it works. And one more point on this. What if we're just relying on our guns, right? Our own ability to protect ourselves and kind of do that. We have that right in this country. I'm not denying that. I'm not denying that. I think that God gives us that, some of that right to defend ourselves sometimes. But if we think that's the avenue that's going to bring some kind of spiritual resurgence or salvation, we're wrong. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're told what kind of war this is, and it has nothing to do with how many guns you may have or not have. It has everything to do with the Word of God. Again, that sharpened, bright blade that is the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. It tells us it's like a wrecking ball. Sometimes God's word is. But this has no place in the physical world to wage this kind of war. What's the solution for having poor spiritual tools? Get good ones. Here's a box of nice, shiny, snap-on tools, which are nice. Nice and expensive, too. But they work great. They feel great in your hands. They do the job better than cheap tools. They do. I know. I have had personal experience. When you have the right tool for the right for the job, it makes life so much easier. And when we're using the right spiritual tools to handle spiritual things, it makes our lives much better. And we're not going to be deceived, we're not going to be uh, uh, mistaken, and we're not going to hurt ourselves. It's all going to be to the good. So now we read Ephesians chapter 6. Beginning in verse 10. What do we do when we have poor or no spiritual tools? We fix them or we get the right one. We use good tools. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. This is a promise that God made, and we've read this before many times. I love this passage. It is a promise. If you wear the armor, you will be there at the end. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given to the gospel of, given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Those are the right tools for the job. Pick up, purchase. Get the right tools, like the pearl of great price. Sell everything you have and get it. How was that? That's what that parable is about. Getting the gospel, whatever it takes. Well, that requires, of course, something like examining the scriptures daily. Lots of passages we could think about there, but I went to Acts 17, verse 11, an example of this. Here's Paul going around preaching to all these people, in this case, another group of Jews, and we're told here in chapter 17, verse 11, these Jews were no mo- more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Remember what happened at Thessalonica? They chased him out of there. They didn't want him there. We've talked about this. He was only in Thessalonica for a couple of weeks, probably, two, three weeks. And they chased him out. Well, now he's in this other town called Berea. What did they do? They didn't chase him out. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They, they wanted to know what the right things were. They wanted to make sure that what Paul was saying was right, and they made sure that it fit. They were sharpening the sword. They were building layers on the breastplate. You know, again, keep going with that. We want to use good tools. We've got to know how to use them. What good is a nice ratchet set like this if you don't know how to use it? What good's a sword if you don't know how to use it? And then thirdly and finally, so we use good tools, we use the ones God gave us, we examine the scriptures daily, and we practice, practice, practice. It's like anything else. I don't know how many times I've said this now, and maybe you're getting tired of it. Anything worth having takes work, takes time and effort. Hebrews 5, verse 14. So remember that. We read that they should have been, in this metaphor, like adults eating meat, but they couldn't. You know how you get there? You practice. How much do babies eat? They don't stop. They keep eating. And then you start giving them, you know, I like to give mine ice cream, something like that. And then you start giving them Maybe baby food or that weird oat, baby oatmeal. And then you start giving them like mushy veggies, Oreos, things like that. Makes your kids bigger and stronger. Right? You don't give them a steak right off the bat. They got to work up to it. It's no different spiritually. That's what he's saying. Solid food, verse 14 is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So I've gone to YouTube quite a bit over the last few weeks because I know how to do stuff, but I always like to check what are some tips and tricks like pros do. Like I can, I can sort of force stuff to happen. I can do drywall. I'm not great at it. But I can do it. So I'm watching YouTube videos. And these guys have all these tips and tricks. Why? Because they've been doing it for 20 years. So there'll be some old guy, and they'll be like, oh, you take your blade, and you put it on here, and you do it like this, and you go, and you're done. I'm like, that's that's not how I do it. And I don't think I can do that for a while. Right? Practice, practice, practice. Why are they good at it? Because they've been doing it for a long time. So as Christians, we should improve. We're going to have hard times. We're going to have weak times. There's going to be great difficulties. We're going to go through you know, all kinds of stuff throughout our lives, but there should be a progress forward. And we'll drop back sometimes, and there'll be a valley. That's normal. 
And are we progressing? Are we practicing? Are we trying to really have, be, have the ability to discern uh, good from evil? We're going to sing this song, There's a Great Day Coming. And again, I appreciate all these songs about Jesus because we didn't really talk a lot about it. But the bottom line, none of this matters if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God and haven't come to him on his terms. Remember, doing it the right way, using the right tools the right way. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You have to have that faith. He also said, confess me before men and my Father will confess you. You must make that statement. He also said, repent of your sins. This is Jesus I'm talking about. And he also said, be baptized for the remission of those sins. That's the right tool for the job to enter into the kingdom that Josh was talking about this morning. The Lord's up. The kingdom that Christ ate with them and that now sits and reigns on, that's the way you get in. That's how you sign up. And then, well, again, you live your life. And you're thoughtful and productive and working toward this greater goal that is the goal of Christ. So we want you to think about that. If you've not entered the kingdom, let us help you do that. We can fill the baptistry and have you baptized if that's uh, where you are, if you have questions or comments, we'd love to hear those things too. Perhaps you need prayers or help of some kind. Perhaps just right there, right now, as we sing the song, you just need to decide, I'm going to do better. Whatever it is, you need our help, let us know as we stand and as we sing.